In this video, we'll try to get a basic understanding of transformers, a type of machine learning model designed for processing sequences. They were introduced in the paper Attention is All You Need back in 2017, and have since gained fairly widespread use. The original paper focused on natural language tasks, and this is where transformers have been most commonly used. Prominent examples include BERT and GPT-3, but they can be applied to other types of data as well, such as images. DALI, a transformer-based model developed recently by OpenAI, synthesizes images based on text descriptions. In this example, we have this silly text prompt about a baby radish and a tutu walking a dog, and impressively, the model generates images of exactly that. The architecture of the transformer can be a little intimidating when you first see it. This is the figure from the original paper, and it looks like there's quite a bit going on. But many of these blocks are things you may already be familiar with, like feedforward networks. The key novel components are these positional encoding and multi-head attention blocks, which we'll look at shortly. But before we dive into the architecture, let's take a second to understand why the authors developed the transformer. One motivation is that we want to limit the lengths of paths that signals must traverse when learning long-range dependencies. Maybe our model is summarizing a long document and the meaning of a certain word depends on something encountered several sentences prior. A recurrent model, like a standard RNN that processes words sequentially, has path lengths that grow linearly in the distance between two positions of interest. In contrast, with a transformer, path lengths will always be constant regardless of the distance. Another motivation is that, for long sequences, we'd ideally like to parallelize computation within training examples. In mini-batch training, we already parallelize across examples, but memory limitations make parallelizing within examples desirable for extra speedup. Recurrent models prevent this. Convolutional sequence models can alleviate this issue, but still face the issue of distance-dependent path lengths. Transformers allow for more parallelization than recurrent models, while also handling long-range dependencies. They leverage what's called self-attention to compute updated representations for each sequence element in parallel. The attention mechanism is going to allow each representation to kind of differentially consider the representations in every other position, and the communication paths will have the same length for all pairs of elements. Let's first walk through the encoder and learn how each component works. The decoder will have many of the same components with slight modifications. Using language as an example domain, we start with some raw input sentence, and our vocabulary maps each word to a unique integer. Obviously, these token values I'm showing are much smaller than they would really be. The actual vocabulary would contain tens of thousands of words. These integer tokens are passed through an embedding layer, a simple lookup table that pairs each integer with a learned continuous vector. This is standard for natural language. Now, before we discuss positional encodings, let's understand attention, and we'll see what role positional encodings play afterwards. The attention mechanism consists of queries, keys, and values. The basic idea is that a query vector will be compared to a set of key vectors to determine how compatible they are. Each key vector comes paired with a value vector. The greater the compatibility of a given key with the query, the greater influence the corresponding value will have on the output of the attention mechanism. All three of these components, queries, keys, and values, are learned during training. Let's take a look at how a single head of multi-head attention works. Here we have our initial embeddings at the beginning of the encoder, one for each word. We need to extract a key and value vector for each one, which are implemented as linear transformations of the embeddings. We'll also get a query vector for each word, but let's just focus on the first word for now. We compute a dot product between the query and each key, including the key from the same word. Determining compatibility between queries and keys in this way is known as dot product attention. Let's call this first dot product alpha zero, the next alpha one, and so on. A greater dot product indicates higher compatibility between the given query and key. The resulting alpha vector is basically a set of unnormalized weights. To normalize them so that they are non-negative in sum to one, they get passed to a softmax, 
but just before applying the softmax, the weights are rescaled by dividing by the dimensionality of the query and key vectors, dk. Okay, so why this scaling factor? Well, the performance of dot product attention seems to suffer for larger values of dk. The authors believe that this is due to the softmax's gradient vanishing for high magnitude input. If we suppose, for example, that the elements of a query vector and key vector are all independent, with mean 0 and variance 1, then the variance of their dot product is dk. Dividing by the standard deviation, root dk, helps counteract this. Once the weights are normalized, we use them to take a linear combination of the value vectors. This will be the output of the attention mechanism. We can think of it as an updated representation for the first word. Now again, we don't only want to do this for the first word. We want to use this procedure for each word's representation in parallel. Let's stack these query, key, and value vectors into three matrices, which we'll call Q, K, and V. The attention operation can now be defined efficiently via a couple matrix multiplications. The output will be another matrix where each row is an updated representation for the word in the corresponding sequence position. One neat thing is that attention is somewhat interpretable because we can actually look at the learned attention weights. These might correspond to the syntactic or semantic structure of a sentence. Now, if we only use a single attention head, the linear combination of value vectors leads to a kind of averaging effect that limits the resolution of the learned representations. To alleviate this, the authors propose using multiple attention heads that can learn different representations simultaneously. For H attention heads, we'll have H sets of learned projection matrices, WQ, WK, and WV. Here, I indexes over the heads. These matrices will project each of the word representations to H different query, key, and value vectors. The queries and keys, of course, have equal dimensionality, dk, due to the dot product. In practice, the value dimensionality, dv, is often set to be equal to dk. The overall multi-head attention block computes the original attention function h times. q, k, and v are all identical, just the stacked word representations at a given layer. Later, in the decoder, we'll see how q, k, and v can come from different sources. The h output matrices are concatenated, and then multiplied with another weight matrix, w, o, to linearly project the learned representations back to the original embedding dimensionality. In the paper, the value vector dimensionality is set to be equal to the embedding dimensionality divided by the number of heads. In this case, WO is a square matrix. Now again, unlike in a recurrent model, we see that multi-head attention does not process the input sequentially. So how will it actually condition on the order of the words? Positional encodings enable this. Just as we mapped each value token to a fixed length vector embedding, we will do the same for position tokens. One way of doing this is simply learning them, so having a separate, learnable lookup table for position tokens. Alternatively, the authors also propose a handcrafted fixed encoding scheme. Essentially, each dimension follows a sinusoidal curve, decreasing in frequency as the dimension index i increases. Here, even dimensions follow a sine curve and odd dimensions follow a cosine, but these could be split up in any arbitrary way. Let's visualize these encodings we have the encodings for the first 300 sequence positions. The x-axis is the dimension index, there are 512 in total, and the y-axis is the position. As we go down the y-axis, we see the encoded values alternate between light and dark, that is high and low numerical values, but at slower rates for greater dimensions. The authors make the case that these handcrafted encodings not only represent global position, because each vector is unique, but they're also well suited to relative positioning. Take the vector at position t, then the positional encoding at position t plus k, for some fixed offset k, can be computed as a linear function of the encoding at position t. The authors also make the argument that these fixed encodings can potentially let the model extrapolate to longer sequences during deployment than those encountered during training. While this seems reasonable, the learned portions of the model may not be able to do so. In any case, the authors state that the learned and fixed encoding routes led to equivalent performance.
The positional encodings have the same dimensionality as the input embeddings, and we sum them together before feeding them to the encoder. Now, multi-head attention is the first of two sublayers of an encoder layer. After each sublayer, we apply both a residual connection and layer normalization. The residual connection just adds a copy of the input to the output. So here that means the word representations before a multi-head attention block are added to the output representations. Then, layer normalization takes our word vectors and essentially normalizes each one individually to have zero mean and variance one. This was originally proposed for recurrent neural networks as a way to stabilize training, but helps transformers too. The second sublayer is a position-wise feed-forward network. This applies a simple network of two fully connected layers with ReLU activation between them to each word representation. After the second sublayer, we again apply a residual connection and layer normalization. So we finished walking through one encoder layer. We can stack these up n times to form the full encoder. The end result is a fixed length vector representation for each word, just like we started with, except now these representations consider the full context of the sequence, unlike the original input embeddings. Looking at the right side of the figure, we see the decoder. Again, many of the components are the same, so we'll specifically look at the differences. Just as we did for the encoder's input, we compute embeddings and positional encodings for the decoder's input, which is the target sequence. But then we reach this masked multi-head attention block. What does this mean? Well, a mask is needed to ensure that we respect the temporal dependency of the output sentence. That is, at deployment time, the output sentence is sampled autoregressively, one word at a time. The prediction at position t should only depend on the words that were sampled prior to t. Incorporating a mask during self-attention ensures this while still allowing parallel computation during training. In each of the masked attention layers during training, when we update the representation at a given position, it should pay zero attention to any of the later sequence positions. The mask is simply an upper triangular matrix, with negative infinities above the main diagonal and zeros everywhere else. It's added to the result of the query key multiplication before the softmax. Any position with a negative infinity in the mask will result in a zero after the softmax, that is, placing zero weight on the corresponding value vector. So we understand the masked multi-head attention block, but what's this other attention block here? Well, the attention blocks we've seen so far implemented self-attention, where the queries, keys, and values all came from the same sequence. For the encoder, this was the source sentence, and for the decoder, it's the target sentence. This third attention block implements what's called cross or encoder-decoder attention. The vectors do not all come from the same sequence. Here, the queries come from the previous layer of the decoder, but the keys and values come from the final output of the encoder. During deployment, this allows the decoder to attend not only to the tokens sampled so far, but also to the input sequence. This of course is crucial if we want our output to actually condition on the input, that is, have our, say, French output sentence actually correspond to some English input. Just like the encoder layers, each decoder layer applies a residual connection and layer normalization to each sublayer. The end result of the last decoder layer is a vector representation for each word in the target sequence. But what do we do with these? How do we train our model to predict the teeth word given all the words up to position t minus 1? A final linear layer is applied to each position, mapping each vector representation to a set of unnormalized logits over the output vocabulary, followed by a softmax. During training, we use a typical maximum likelihood objective, adjusting the transformer's parameters to maximize the probability of the next step target token. In order to respect the autoregressive dependence, the teeth token is predicted using the decoder's output at time t minus 1. One quick thing to add about the transformer architecture is that, depending on your application, you don't necessarily need both the encoder and decoder. For example, if you're only trying to generate sequences, a decoder-only architecture may be sufficient. If you're trying to learn a rich sequence representation for, say, a classification task, Maybe you'll just use the encoder portion. Towards the end of attention is all you need, 
there's a bit of complexity analysis for various architectures. Let's just look at self-attention versus recurrence. N will represent the sequence length, and D the representation dimensionality. We already discussed the differences in terms of sequential operations and path lengths earlier in the video, but what about this complexity per layer? For self-attention, the n squared times d comes from the matrix multiplications used in dot product attention. Examining the dimensions tells us that standard multiplication leads to O of n squared times d operations. For a basic RNN, we apply weight matrices of size d by d with d-dimensional vector representations for the input and hidden state at each of the n steps in the sequence, resulting in O of n times d squared operations. So which is more expensive? Well, if the sequence length n is smaller than the representation dimension d, then we don't suffer a high cost with the transformer. This is often the case if we're only operating on shorter sequences, like a couple sentences. But for longer inputs, the quadratic cost in n can become expensive relative to RNNs. There's a nice connection between transformers and graph or message passing neural networks. We won't go into the details of GNNs here, but if you've seen them before, you may realize that we can view transformers as a kind of GNN that treats sequences as fully connected graphs. The transformer allows all nodes to preferentially communicate during message passing according to the attention weights. There's been a ton of interesting work on transformers in the past few years. For example, on making them more efficient, developing theory on why they actually work well, as well as some really cool applications. Check out the links in the description to learn more. Thanks for watching.